All giving to St Andrew's Cathedral are used to support the ministries of our church, as well as the work of our diocese, deaneries and other parts of the world. Your faithful tithing and offerings enable our church to carry out her mission according to her budgeted plan. More details can be found at cathedral.org.sg slash giving. Brothers and sisters, we have come together as the family of God in our Father's presence to offer Him praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive His holy word, to bring before Him the needs of the world, to ask His forgiveness of our sins, and to seek His grace, that through His Son, Jesus Christ, we may give ourselves to His service. Let us join our hearts and worship God with our opening hymn.
we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to Almighty God. And together we pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our fellow men in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Now receive the Lord's forgiveness. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As God's forgiven people, we declare, O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Let us worship the Lord, all praise to his name. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Let us exalt the Lord with songs of praise.
praise Him this morning. Let's worship Him and lift our voices and let's ascribe majesty to Him.
Let us pray together the collect of the day for the second Sunday of Christmas. Almighty God, in the birth of your Son, you have poured on us the new light of your incarnate word and shown us the fullness of your love. Help us to walk in his light and dwell in his love, that we may know the fullness of his joy, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first lesson is taken from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1, commencing from verses 1 through 11. Nehemiah, chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah. Now it happened in the month of Kislev, in the twentieth year, as I was in Susa the citadel, that Herninai, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second lesson is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, commencing from verses 13 through 17. John, chapter 2, verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Church, it is my great joy to bring you God's word on this very first weekend of 2021. First, allow me to welcome the two new clergymen to this community, Reverend Christopher Chan and Reverend Daniel Lim. 
I hope, church, you will, over time, get to know them and their family members. And next, I want to take this opportunity to wish all of you a blessed 2021. 2020 has been a challenging year, but the Lord has been faithful. He has helped us to overcome, and we have now made it to 2021. And for all those who were at the covenant service, you would have heard me mention that our focus for 2021 is a deeper life in Christ. And I would like to take this opportunity to explain what is a deeper life in Christ before we plunge into our sermon for today. The relationship that we have with our Lord Jesus Christ varies from person to person. Just because we believe in Christ, it does not necessarily mean that you have a deep, intimate relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. Moreover, with any relationship, it, it is always two ways and it involves two persons. And Jesus makes it clear here in John chapter 15, verse 4, he says, Abide in me and I in you. The only way in which we can abide in Him is to learn and to develop a deep, intimate relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what He says in John 15, verses 9 to 10. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in in his love. Can you imagine that the creator of heaven and earth desires to have a relationship with you? And the promise is given to those who love him and who keeps his commandments that you, we will have a relationship with him. And this is to occur throughout your life as a disciple of Christ. And it is with that church that I felt prompted by the Lord that as we cross over into the new year, that we are to focus on building a deeper life in Christ. And to start this year with the series on a deeper life in Christ, we will, for the next seven weeks, come together on a centralized sermon series. And we will be looking at the book of Nehemiah. And we are focused on three aspects that are important to build a deeper life in Christ. We will re-envision God's purpose, we will rebuild as a community, and we will reignite our passion for God. And today, we'll be looking at chapter 1, verses 1 to 11, and on the topic of re-envisioning God's purpose for the season. But before we do that, we want to look at the background of Nehemiah. For many, the book of Nehemiah is merely about the rebuilding of the broken walls of Jerusalem. But if you dig deeper, you will realize that Nehemiah is more than just a construction project. There are many precious lessons to be learned, leadership lessons and spiritual lessons that are important that you'll find in the book of Nehemiah. And if I have to give a brief overview of the book of Nehemiah, it will be something like this. Nehemiah is about the exiled community of Israel returning to rebuild the broken walls together in 52 days, a task deemed impossible and carried out under the most challenging conditions. And Nehemiah is about the restoration of worship in God's temper and the people's passion for God reignited. And next, we want to look at the person Nehemiah. We were told that he is the son of Hekeliah in verse 1, and he was the cupbearer to the king Artaxerxes in verse 11, the most powerful and influential man on the face of earth during Nehemiah's time. Nehemiah's role as a cupbearer was a position of great power, authority, and wealth. As a cupbearer, he was the king's most trusted man. Given that a cupbearer has a high-ranking position in the court, Nehemiah was likely to be highly esteemed 
by the people. And next, we see that Nehemiah was committed and loyal to his own Jewish people. In verses 2 to 4, when Hanani, one of his brothers, returned from Judah, Nehemiah was most concerned to find out what had happened to the Jews that survived the exile. And he was also concerned about the physical state of Jerusalem. When he found that the exiles were in great trouble and the walls of Jerusalem broken and the gates destroyed, Nehemiah wept and mourned for days. Verse 4. Nehemiah's commitment and loyalty to his people would have been understandable if he had been raised as a child in Jerusalem. But the fact was, Nehemiah was a Jew born in Persia during the exile. He was likely a second or third generation exile who had lived his entire life in Persia, started his own family in Persia and have worked his entire life in Persia to rise to such a high position in the Persian court. And it was likely that Nehemiah himself had never stepped foot into Jerusalem prior to this. How do we do know that? Historically, we know that the Assyrians conquered Israel, the northern kingdom, in 722 BC, and scattered the people. And King Nebuchadnezzar conquered Judah, the southern kingdom, and deported all the Jews to Babylon in 597 BC. Sixty years later, at 539 BC, King Cyrus of Persia invaded the Babylonian Empire. The fact that Nehemiah was serving the sixth king in the line of the Persian Empire, King Artaxerxes, that would put Nehemiah's writing somewhere between 445 BC to 430 BC. And do the sum, it becomes clear that Nehemiah was the second or third generation Jews living in exile in Persia. Nehemiah's knowledge of his people, Nehemiah's knowledge of Jerusalem, Nehemiah's knowledge of the great temple of God, and his knowledge of the law of Moses, and his knowledge of Yahweh, the Creator God, had likely come from his father and forefathers. Despite Nehemiah's unique identity and background, he was deeply committed and loyal to the Jewish people. We would have also, and we can also see that Nehemiah was deeply devoted to God in verse 4. When he heard what had happened to his people in Jerusalem, he fasted and prayed before God of heaven. Remember, Nehemiah was the second or third generation exile who had lived his entire life in Persia. He was exposed to the Persians' mythology, the gods whom the Persians worshipped and revered. And not forgetting that he was a high-ranking officer in the Persian court, a cup-bearer to the king. It was easy for someone like Nehemiah, who had no first-hand encounter with Yahweh God, the God of his father and forefathers, to in his state, Worship the gods of the Persians. Yet, verses 4 to 10, we could see that Nehemiah was clearly brought up in the knowledge and faith of God and in the law of Moses. Now that we understand the person Nehemiah, we want to examine his prayer from verses 5 to 8. Friends, it was in his deep devotion to God that Nehemiah became aware of God's purpose for the Jews to become exiles under the Assyrian's rule, under the Babylonian's rule, and now under the Persians. Israel, the apple of God's eyes, was once upon a time the most powerful nations on earth. Remember the fame of King David? The fame of David went out into all the lands and the Lord brought the fear of him upon all nations. 
1 Chronicles 14, 17. Remember the fame of King Solomon. Thus King Solomon excelled all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom, and the whole earth sought the presence of King Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God has put into his mind. Every one of them brought his presents, articles of silver, gold, garments, myrrh, spices, horses, and mules, so much year by year. In 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 23 to 25. But Israel was brought to her knees, and the pride of Israel, the magnificent temper of God in Jerusalem, destroyed, and the people of God scattered in Persia and all across the face of the earth. Nehemiah realized that all this took place because Israel had turned against God. Verses 5 to 8. And allow me to just read to you a portion of Nehemiah's prayer. In verse 6, he says, I now pray before you, Almighty God, day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we had sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. And verse 7, We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that we have commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. Friends, as we hear the confession and prayers of Nehemiah, we need to pause and ask, what is God's purpose for this season that we are living in right now? For a microscopic virus to bring the whole world, even the most powerful of nations, to her knees. We have seen how wars crippled nations. We have seen how natural disasters like the earthquakes, tsunamis, typhoons, floods crippled nations. We have seen how famines crippled nations. We have seen how financial crisis crippled nations. We have seen how SARS, MERS, Ebola and H1N1 outbreaks crippled nations. But we have never seen until now a pandemic of this scale that has brought the whole world to a grinding halt to its knees. More than 1.8 million people have succumbed to the virus. My dear friends, we need to seriously reflect on Nehemiah's prayer in verses 6 and 7, in a time like this. We have sinned against you, Heavenly Father. Even I and my father's house have sinned. Nehemiah confessed on behalf of his generation and the generation of his forefathers. And we have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, the rules that you have commanded your servant Moses. And so I appeal to you, my dear friends, that we must not miss God's purpose for this pandemic, the season that we are living in right now. And for me, this pandemic has surfaced many fault lines, and I will highlight one. And that is our relationship with God. When the circuit breakers started, many of us were delighted. We were happy that we were confined in our homes. And many have shared that as a result of that, they were able to regularly return 
to their daily devotion. To get into the routine of reading the Bible and praying unhurriedly. Something that most of us have missed or neglected during the pre-COVID days. Probably due to our busyness. But I ask, why do we need a pandemic to make us realize that business has usurped God's place in our lives? Why do we need a pandemic to make us realize that we have drifted away from God? Why do we need a pandemic to make us realize that we have acted corruptly against God? Why do we need the pandemic to make us realize that we have feared to obey God's commands and teachings? Why do we need the pandemic to make us realize that we have feared to care for the poor and needy? Why do we need a pandemic to make us realize we have neglected the Great Commission? What is God's purpose for this season? And why should we take this season seriously? I like one how uh, a Christian writer explained why we should take this season seriously. He said, if we view COVID-19 as a virus that has come and will eventually go, we will not think very much of it. But if we were to see COVID-19 as a rehearsal for end time, we then will take the season ahead of us more seriously. It is true, isn't it? Much of what is happening right now certainly seems to match some of the end time prophecies in the Bible. In Luke chapter 21, Jesus says, this tells us of the signs of the end time. He says there will be great earthquakes, famines, pestilence in various places and fearful events and great signs from heaven. And this pandemic has given us a glimpse of how the final days might look like. It is a time of fear, anxiety and uncertainty. It is a time of shortages, a time of illness and death, a time of isolation, and a time of loneliness. It is a time that we can't even gather physically to comfort each other. And if this seems to be a little depressing, friends, there is hope. We can hope in God by responding in repentance and faith. And in the season ahead of us, we need to learn to run back to God, to ask for His forgiveness for how we have been living our lives independently without Him. And instead, to, to turn to Him, to rely on His strength, comfort in the time to come. And for Nehemiah, repentance was exactly what he prayed for. When he reminded God of his covenant with Moses in verses 9 to 10, he said, But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are far in the outermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them to bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name and dwell there. Perhaps for some of you, you may be thinking, Pastor, I have drifted so far away from God. But God is saying to you today, though your outcasts are in the outermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather you. And no matter how far away you may be from God, Today, He is ready to bring you home. And today, we are thankful that we can repent and renew our relationship with God wherever we are 
But in Nehemiah's time, for the Jews to seek forgiveness from God, that would require them to return to the temple of God in Jerusalem. And to do so, it would require a miracle because for more than 300 years, the Jews were not allowed to return to worship in Jerusalem. What stands between the Jews in the exile and them returning to God's temple in Jerusalem was not just a broken wall, but it was the king of Persia, King Artaxerxes. And hence, Nehemiah's prayer in verse 11, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name, to give success to your servant today. Grant him, grant me mercy in the sight of this man, King Artaxerxes. Nehemiah knew that the only way for the Jews in exile to be restored at God's chosen people and for them to fulfill God's word to Isaiah for Israel to be a light for the nations was for him to now stand in the gap to plead with the king for the impossible for the exiles to be released and to be allowed to return to Jerusalem, for resources to rebuild the wars, and for the worship of God to be restored in the temple in Jerusalem. That all may seem like an easy task, and some of us may be wondering, what is the big deal? Nehemiah's request to the king would mean the end of his career. Nehemiah's request could also mean the end of his life. Remember, he was the cupbearer to the king, a high-ranking officer in the Persian court. And he was living in a time where the Persians were out to rule the world and the Jews had always been a threat to them. But Nehemiah was ready to offer his life. Hence his prayer, God grant me mercy. He was ready to stand in the gap. He was ready to bring hope to his people so that they might be restored through their worship of God in Jerusalem. And I want to end with this, my dear friends. Are you ready to stand in the gap for yourself and for your loved ones and for those who are still living in darkness to return to the heart of worship of our Father in heaven. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, as we stand at the beginning of this year, we confess our need of your presence and your guidance as we face the future. We each have our hopes and expectations for the year that is ahead of us, but you alone know what it holds for us. And only you can give us the strength and the wisdom that we will need to meet all the challenges. So help us to humbly put our hands into yours and to trust you and to seek your will for our lives and for this church during this coming year. And in the midst of life's uncertainties in the days ahead, Assure us of the certainty of your unchanging love. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.
Let us declare our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. We will now have a time of intercession. Let us pray. Let's quieten our hearts as we prepare our minds and pray for the church and for the world. And let us thank God for his goodness. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Jesus Christ, and has promised through the same, your Son, our Saviour, to hear us when we pray in faith. We pray for the world that is still struggling to the adverse effects of the global COVID-19 pandemic. Sovereign God and our Heavenly Father, we ask for your merciful intervention to stop the rapid transmission of the more contagious strain of COVID-19, which has spread to other European, American and Asian countries, causing further disruption to international travel. We pray that world leaders will learn from this pandemic and take a far-sighted view of health emergencies, that they will have the political will to work together to address climate change and better prepare for future pandemic. In times like this, and in places of darkness, we ask that you will shine the light of the gospel and your saving grace, that many will see and come to the light of the saving grace of Christ Jesus, our Savior. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. In our homeland, we thank God for bringing Singapore out of a very critical situation. For an efficient and effective COVID-19 task force, scientists, healthcare, and frontline personnel who work tirelessly and sacrificiously to bring the number of infection down and to contain its spread. Dear God, we pray that all that we have gained by the grace of God will be maintained as Singapore moves into phase three of the reopening of our economy and the vaccination program that is ongoing. They will continue to remain alert and vigilant to the dangers and not lapse into complacency. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For the Diocese of Singapore, we pray for our Bishop Titus Chung as he continues to seek your divine will and to fulfill your purpose for the diocese. We pray for your bountiful blessings on him as he leads us with godly counsel, courage and strength under the anointing and empowering of the Holy Spirit. We pray for the vicars of our 27 parishes to be divinely led as they set clear directions for our parishes in the new year. We pray also, also for our parishioners to embrace and align themselves to God's revealed will, that all parishes will bless and support one another as we unite to advance your kingdom in Singapore and beyond. Within our own diocese, we thank you, dear God, for bringing us into a new season in this coming year. We thank you for our new vicar, the Reverend Louis Liu, and all incoming priests, we pray for your divine anointing that our vicar will be empowered to lead us in the re-envisioning, rebuilding, and realigning the cathedral. Father in heaven, we pray for good stewardship 
for the opportunities in phase three to open our church to more worshippers for good planning and organization of the various services, for the safety of all, for deeper community bonding, and for zeal in outreach that the cathedral will continue to shine for Christ in the heart of the city. Strengthen our bishop and dean, the right Reverend Dr. Titus Chung, our vicar, the Reverend Louis Liu, the clergy and pastoral staff, and all in your church, that in the service of Christ, that those who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayers. So hear us, our Father in heaven, for you are able to do far more abundantly mm. than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, Grant us these our prayers and humble requests as we, your children, in rejoicing in the fellowship of all your sins, do commend ourselves and all Christian people to your unfailing love. Together, merciful, merciful Father, Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us sing our closing hymn.
Now receive the Lord's blessing as we bring our service to a close. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.